fundamental building block of digital electronics are transistors. So very simply, we can consider a transistor just to be a switch, and by opening and closing the switch, we can control how an electrical current, current flows through it. Now this switching behaviour is the basis of all digital devices, and essentially it's the origins of the zeros and ones that we're familiar with when we come to think of digital electronics. So as, to as technology has progressed, transistors have shrunk, and it's become possible to fit more and more transistors inside integrated circuits, what we call ICs and microprocessors. So these are the things you find inside of your computer. Now, because it can fit more transi transistors inside of these circuits, it's led to a huge increase in performance and this has driven the entire digital electronics revolution. So now a top of the range PC has a processor which has got well over 1 billion transistors at the size of the die, so the actual size of the processor. You know, it's typically around 200 millimeters squared, so that's probably about the size of your thumbnail or something like that. So over a billion transistors in an area that small. And also now when we come to think of clock speeds, you know, we've got a few gigahertz as pretty much standard now. So that, you know, that means that these transistors are switching on and off billions of times a second. So they've not just got billions of transistors, they've got billions of transistors that are switching off billions of times per second. So in 1965, Gordon Moore, who was the co-founder of Intel, predicted that the transistor count in an IC would double every year. So later that was corrected to every two years. But the semiconductor industry now has used this as a roadmap, so they try and keep up with this prediction. It's not a law in the strictest sense, you know, it's more of a, a prediction. So the semiconductor industry try and use this as a target, so every couple of years they'll try and um, you know, double the amount of transistors they can fit in an IC. And they, you know, they fit more on by making them smaller. So the size, the, um, they kind of define the size by the minimum feature size. So often it's called the process size or the node. So they keep trying to make this processing uh, size smaller. But obviously, future challenges do exist because you can't keep shrinking transistors uh, on and on because you're going to get to the point where you get close to atomic limits. You know, the transistors cannot get smaller than the size of atoms themselves. So this diagram here shows the number of transistors in various processors over the years. So notice as well, this is a logarithmic scale. So each of the squares is a factor of 10 different. So we can see in the 70s, there's various Intel processors, less than 10,000 uh, transistors in them. You know, then 50 years later, you know, approaching 10 billion transistors. So that's a huge increase, you know, ex you know massively exponential increase. So now the top of the range processors, you know, well over 1 billion transistors, you know, over the next few years will start approach, approaching 10 billion. So you can fit more transistors into an IC because the feature size is getting smaller. So this graph shows the minimum feature size over the same period. So again, 1970, the minimum feature size in a transistor was around 10 micrometers, which is still itself, is obviously a very small unit. But over the last... Over the next 50 years, that again drops exponentially. And now it's in the nanometers. So now, currently around this 10 nanometer scale. Again, over the next few years, Intel and other chip manufacturers are trying to lower that even further. You know, seven nanometers down to five nanometers. So that's the roadmap over the next few years. You know, we're going to try and aim to get down to five nanometer uh, minimum feature sizes. So the type of transistors typically used in digital circuits are called MOSFETs, so metal oxide, semiconductor, field effect transistors. So these are made from silicon, manufactured using what we call CMOS technology, so that's complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology. So a transistor has got uh, three terminals, so for the case of a MOSFET, these are the gate, the drain and the source. And essentially these are voltage control switches. So we apply a voltage to the gate, and then this voltage will then control the current flow between the drain and the source. So there's two main types of MOSFET. You know, we've got N types, or sometimes you've seen called N FETs, and P type, what we can call P FETs. So 
So here we can see um, the representation of a transistor as a switch. So an n-type is a bit like a push to make switch. So when there's no voltage on the gates, the transistor stays switched off and there's no direct connection between the drain and the source. But when we apply a voltage to the gates, that's like pushing the switch closed. You know, we kind of turn the transistor on and then we can conduct and it will become a conducting channel between the drain and the source and the current will be able to flow. Now a p-type is the opposite, so that's more like a push to break switch. So now when there's no um, voltage on the gates, the switch will be closed. So the transistors can call it switched on and we can get a conducting channel between the source and the drain. And we can get current to flow. But now when we put a voltage on the gate of a p-type, that's like pushing a push to break switch and breaking that connection will turn the transistor off and we've no longer got this conducting channel and the current won't be able to flow through the transistor. So these are the common symbols you can come you come across. So notice on the n-type and the p-type the drain and the source are on this different sides. So you can see on the p-type Sometimes you see it drawn with a little circle on the gate. Or we use the other representation where we've got the circle around the symbol. You can tell by looking at the arrow which um, which type of transistor it is. But for, because we've got so many transistors in our circuits, it's impossible to design on a transistor by transistor transistor by transistor basis. You can't design a circuit when it's got a billion transistors in it. So instead we use this con concept of abstraction. So we get some transistors and we can combine them into functional blocks that we call logic gates. So we get some transistors, combine them together to create logic gates and then we can combine these logic gates together to create logic circuits and then we can get these logic circuits, we can combine them together to make more complex logic circuits and we can keep doing this, this uh, idea of abstraction, we keep moving up this pyramid if you will, and we call this a hardware, hardware hierarchy. So we're at the bottom of this hierarchy, we've got transistors, and we can combine those together to build logic gates and also memory cells, and then we can use those to create various circuits, multiplexes, adders, flip-flops, and again combine them to get arithmetic logic units, registers. Again, combine these kind of more complex circuits together until we've got full processors, you know, full memories, and then microcontrollers, CPUs, and so on. 